versus your jawless fishes. You saw how the jaws came from uh, the gill arches. Uh, within those jawed fishes, we had things like the placoderms and the acanthodians, these extinct groups. And then we look at some of the uh, major groups that are living, the chondric, these, uh, some of the uh, sarcopterygians like the ripidistians. Uh, they were important because they were our ancestors. Uh, then we were into the actinopterygia, the ray thin fishes, and they're important because they are just dominant. Uh, they are the most common types of fishes that you're going to find in the world. Very diverse, and there's a number of things that contributed to that diversity. So we looked at locomotion, and in the actinopterygii, they have reduced their scales from those big plates that the ostracoderms had and the big bony scales that other fishes had. They reduced those to very thin overlapping scales. That gave them a lot of flexibility. And they modified the shape of their pectoral and pelvic fins to uh, make them more useful. So we're getting better maneuverability and better flexibility. That opens up a lot of new niches for those animals. As far as feeding goes, suction feeding is very important. Many other fishes will use suction feeding to a certain degree, but the actinopterygii do it best. Jaw protrusion, sort of part of uh, suction feeding, but it is also helpful for many fish because they can rasp things off the surface, like algae off of the surface. And that also, by protruding the jaws, it gets the teeth out near that prey quicker. And then finally, pharyngeal teeth was the last thing that we mentioned. Some fish do have teeth on the gill arches so that they can use the teeth in their mouth for capturing the prey, and they can use those teeth in the pharynx to process that prey. All right, another thing that's important to the success of the actinopterygii is buoyancy control. And specifically, it's going to be a structure that's called a gas bladder swim bladder, air bladder. All of those terms are the same. And just to give you a feel for where we're located uh, in a fish, it's going to be somewhat dorsal, above the midline of the animal, and just underneath the vertebrae. And so this is a very important structure in the actinopterygii. The other fishes do not have it. Okay. So, I don't think I need this anymore. Okay. Structure of this thing. Well, first off, it, it forms as a dorsal evagination of the gut. All right, so that you have your intestinal tract, and then we're going to get a structure that forms by butting off, if you will. It's an evagination of that developing gut. It may remain connected to the pharynx. It always is initially. Right? In the pharyngeal area, we're getting the, uh, the gas bladder as an evagination it may retain this connection to the gut, even into adulthood, right? That connection is called the pneumatic duct. If a fish has this connection as an adult, we describe that condition or that fish as being physostomus. Physo means bladder, stomus, stone, opening. In many of the fishes, probably most of the actinopterygii, this pneumatic duct does disappear during development of that animal so that the gas bladder is totally separated from the digestive tract in an adult. Is that usually the case? Yes. That's the most common. And that condition then would be 
called physoclistus, clistus meaning closed. Okay, so we can have a physostomus or a physoclistus air bladder. What's the function of these things? A couple different possibilities. One is respiration. So we could get gas exchange occurring across the surface of the gas bladder to give that animal some oxygen. If that occurred, would it be a physostomus or a physoclistus bladder? Why? Because it has an accessory atmosphere. Sure. OK. So if you're going to use it as an accessory respiratory organ, all right, they're still getting most of their, their oxygen from their gills. But they're going to use it as an accessory respiratory organ. They need access to uh, the atmosphere. So the oxygen would come in through the digestive tract, through the pneumatic duct, and then into the bladder. Many fishes will gulp, gulp, gulp air. Um, Amia will do this. Lepisosteus will do this. Many different fishes. You've probably all seen goldfishes. I'm not sure what goldfish are, though, so I'll shut up. Um, but Amia and Lepisosteus, they have a highly vascularized gas bladder and they will use it to help them breathe. So, some fishes will use it for respiration, but its primary function is as a hydrostatic <laughs> organ. It's going to allow the fish to maintain neutral so what do we need? What's going on here? Well, let's look at specific gravity of fish and then their surrounding water. Right? Specific gravity of typical fish about 1.076. Do you guys know what specific gravity is? It's just a ratio of the density of whatever you're talking about to the density of pure water. So we're saying that a typical fish has a higher 